Well, good afternoon, everyone. As I'm sure you're all aware, I am Kevin Klein, and you just heard from Kira Provenzano of the NGA's Member Services Team. I'd like to welcome you to our final session of the President's Council Week and thank everyone for attending this afternoon's session, Innovation and Rejuvenation in Club Management. The President's Council is traditionally one of the most important days on the NGA's calendar, and given the challenges this year has brought to us all, We've been pleased to be able to offer a week full of informative virtual sessions. The outstanding turnout underscores the great commitment we all have to keeping our clubs healthy and to the support we get from the leadership of our member clubs. We hope everyone will be able to take something away from today's session that will help at your own clubs. I'd like to stress that this is intended to be an interactive session. The whole intention of the President's Council is to bring you, MGA member club leaders together to share and exchange ideas and discuss what we feel are important issues facing clubs in the game of golf. This afternoon's presentation will be followed by a question and answer period. So again, we encourage your active participation and involvement. The MGA is committed to supporting our clubs during this difficult time for everyone. We aim to over deliver and be the best we can possibly be and hope meetings like today help in that goal. We wanna thank all of our supporting sponsors for this week and we hope you will seek them out when they can be of help to you and your members. Please let Kira and I know if we can provide additional info on any of our partners listed here. Now we'd like to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Joe Crenn, Chief Executive Officer and General Manager of Farmington Country Club of Virginia. When we polled general managers about topics that have been of the most interest to our boards over the past year, membership and membership engagement come up time and time again. Specifically, how to increase value proposition and continue the momentum of what clubs have been able to provide to their members during these past seven months with COVID. For many of you, the question is, how do clubs in the golf industry take advantage and sustain the increase in new usage of the club and course? Innovating opportunities, events, and activities can all generate greater attractiveness to new members and a broader market share. As the club industry is progressing, finding new ways to create lifestyle attractiveness is essential. Joe is here to explore some fundamental concepts that are guaranteed to boost your creative thinking. Additionally, these past six months have been challenging for everyone, and Joel will discuss COVID-19's impact on private clubs and his thoughts on how to sustain the momentum and continue their success under these difficult circumstances. I think we'd all agree that the struggling economy, demographics, and societal trends have made for challenging times for private clubs. However, not all clubs are struggling, and many clubs around the country have implemented highly successful programs to better position themselves to retain and recruit members. Joe is uniquely qualified to share his ideas on these concepts and best practices that he's implemented at his own club. Joe, as I mentioned, is the CEO and general manager of Farmington Country Club in Charlottesville, Virginia, and has been there since 2012. Farmington is a member-owned private club with 2,500 plus members offering golf, tennis, fitness, aquatics, overnight accommodations, and childcare. Farmington is ranked consistently as a top 40 platinum club and recognized as a top private club in Virginia. Joe is the club's fifth GM in its 93 year history. He is a certified executive and club manager, serves as a national director for the Club Management Association of America, and in 2017 was awarded the James Brewer Award for Excellence in Club Management. What a background. Joe speaks in private club management all over the world, and we are delighted that he's here to share his experiences with us to share his thoughts on how our clubs could be well positioned for success. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Crenn. All right, thank you. Um, you know, every time you hear your own intro, it kind of makes you wonder who they're talking about sometimes, but what a topic, right? So this topic I'm about to give you is normally an hour and a half session that I've crammed down. Um, so I'm gonna fly through some ideas and really where a lot of this innovation and rejuvenation started probably about four or five years ago, the um, Private Club Marketing Association asked if I could put together a presentation on innovation. And I said, that's great, but what do you think qualifies us for innovation? And she said, well, you have a food truck, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. And I said, well, if innovation and food truck is what it is, I'll figure this out. But they said, can you make it more like a case study? So I've really changed this presentation for you all today to really the idea is to, to make you think and how can you rejuvenate your club? A lot of you are doing these things and hopefully this will be affirmation for you. And some of you may have an idea of what it is and hopefully that too will push you into doing this. So 
what we're going to do is I'm going to take you through a journey. This originally was a case study, um, and I'll talk a little bit about it. But I'm going to fly through some slides. I'm going to throw out some ideas. I encourage you at the end to ask questions. And more importantly, um, I always tell these when I give this presentation, you know, the yeah buts cannot come up in this presentation. When people look at me, I say, yeah, but I'm not a club that big, or yeah, but I don't have a size, or yeah, but this. Get rid of the yeah buts during this process because there's something in here, I promise you, that will get your creative juices going. And it's done tremendous wonders for our club. So we'll get started. I like to start it here and say, how hard, how hard is it to sell what we do every day, right? This is what people have an idea of clubs. And this is hard to do over camera because I can't read your faces and see this. But the one quick story I want to tell here, as any good husband does, I asked my wife, um, hey, I'm about to give a presentation to James Madison students in hospitality about club management. Here's my slides. And I had this slide in there talking about club life. And my wife looked at me and said, "What? why are you putting this in there? They're not going to know what this is. And I'm like, you're crazy. It's Caddyshack. Of course they're going to know what this is. Um, so I get to the presentation, I get to this slide, and I show this, and I say, okay, I got to stop. How many people, this was a class of about 65, how many people in this room know what movie this is? Four hands went up. I, I died a little bit inside, right? But really, when you start looking at it, while Caddyshack is funny, this is what people think clubs are, and they still kind of think this is kind of what we are. But really, when we look at clubs, You know, the first question starts to come in, you know, are clubs dying? And back in 2015, Kevin Riley, who does a lot of publishing for the club industry, came up with this and he says, no, they're not dying. We just need to evolve. And I think during COVID, especially, you're starting to see this is where we need to do. We need to start rethinking who we are. We need to start going forward and finding out where we need to be. Um, when you do anything in grad school, you know, in marketing classes, this is the you know, product life cycle, right? So you start looking at where you are in, in this product life cycle. Apple is not reinventing Apple 12 or X or whatever we're in right now, right after they're doing six, seven, or eight, right? They're already thinking about this down the road. So I would say there's a lot of clubs, unfortunately, start to try to reinvent themselves when they're in that decline cycle. When you're in the growth cycle, when you're in maturity, where that green arrow is on this screen, that's where you should start to think about who you are and where you're going. It's not too late. I will say when, when I got to the club here, and this is nothing against the, the team or the management or where we were, but Farmington was trying to figure out where do we need to go? We don't like where we are. We need to make changes, but we don't know how. Um, we were probably in that decline site. People were starting to look at other options in town. And um, so where are you? So you look at this also, McMahon Club Trends put this out. This was actually put out, I think, in 2013 or 14, believe it or not. But this is the quandary we're in every day, right? Clubs celebrate traditions, influence, reserve, formality, special occasions. But what people really want is cutting edge technology. They want a diverse environment. They want to drop in place. So how can you, you know, when you say you're going to listen to your members and talk to your members to see what they want, but they're not even telling you what they want. So how do you get in and how do you start figuring out what your customers or your members are telling you is not really what they want? right? So how do you be encouraged, especially the people on this call, how do you take the lead as leaders of your club, board members, or, or general managers? How do you start trying to figure out where to go? And this is really where we're all competing, right? Um, everybody's looking for facilities, the local businesses, time, demographics. Time and time again, when you're sitting in your meetings, well, this club down the street's doing this, or this club's doing that. And people say to us all the time, well, Boar's Head, which is right across the street, is doing this. They're your competition. No. Everything is our competition. And if you need new members every year to keep your, your rosters whole, you need to be finding ways to address all of these things. It's not just the club down the street. It's not just the restaurant down the street. It's your kids' sports camps, right? So everything is competition for us. And to give you kind of a snapshot, and I won't talk a lot about the club, but to give you an idea of the challenges that we face in this town, right? Farmington is a club that has 2,500 members. Um, I have about 425 employees. We have $22 million of year revenue. Prior to a lot of the stuff I'm about to show you, when we walked in the door, we were a $14 million a year club. We have a population of 150,000 people. So 
You want to talk about finding ways to rejuvenate, finding ways to endear yourself to your membership's lives, not only for your membership, but for your employee life base. You know, we are looking at a facilities master plan. Our club is open 365 because we have overnight rooms, so we never close, right? So how do you reinvent such a historic property? Thomas Jefferson put that first edition onto our building right there that you're looking at, right? So we have history, but yet we want to be forward thinking. So we could have just said, well, we are where we are, and this is who we are, but we're not. And we made a lot of changes and started looking at it. And the first thing we started looking at is, are we a business or are we not, right? And this is what gets me. You know, people always say, well, you're a private club. You know, we're non nonprofit, right? Nonprofit is a tax status. It's not a business plan, right? So many people look at this and say, well, you know, we're a nonprofit. You need to start looking at it. It doesn't mean you lose who you are. It doesn't mean that you make adjustments, but you are a business at the core. I had a member not too long ago was upset because we didn't make a decision to, to do a certain capital project. And as I started explaining to them, look, you know, financially, this was the reason. He looked at me. This is a very successful financial guy. He says, Joe, we're a nonprofit. We shouldn't be worried about money, right? So it's amazing how many people get into this mindset. You have to start making decisions that make sense. doesn't mean it loses who you are, but you've got to decide if you're a business. One of the things you need to look at as well, and this is one of the things we did as a club, is we committed to a financial model. I'm not saying this is the model, but this is what our most successful clubs are doing. You need to look at, you know, are your initiation fees covering your capital? Are your dues covering your fiscal expenses? And are your variable costs covered by the users? Variable costs meaning carts and food and beverage and things like that, right? What is your business model and are you sticking to it? And as your boards start to change and as your leadership changes, do you have a plan to guide you into the future? So how did we start doing this, right? So we started doing some listening sessions. You're going to start to see some of my humor or my movies. I hope that doesn't uh, uh, change your opinion of me also as well. But with listening sessions, right, we started trying to figure out, you can do an annual survey, you can do all these things, but what, what are the members wanting? What are they looking at? So this is something that we started doing that doesn't cost you a lot of time, but we started doing some listening sessions where... I would have random members invited to come in and meet with me. And I would, me and, and a certain individual, right? So if we were talking about fitness, we would have a listening session with fitness and I would say, okay, randomly give me eight people, some who do morning classes, some who do night, some who take training, some who don't. And I really want a good diverse group. And I invite them in to meet with me. Now I'm not gonna have the fitness director sitting there in this meeting with me because they might want to say some things about the operation that they feel uncomfortable. Same thing with food and beverage, right? They don't want the chef sitting there. They're not going to be open. However, as managers and leaders, I had an agreement with my leadership team that I'm going to be unfiltered and share everything with you because you don't want them to feel this is also a witch hunt against them, right? You've got to balance a lot of people on this. But really, I would ask five questions in this listening session. It would be 45 minutes. And it was amazing how many things would come up. But I had some ground rules, right? If this is a fitness session, we're only going to talk about fitness. I'll gladly talk to you about something else afterwards. Um, and I would ask questions. You know, if you own Farmington, what would you change in fitness? Um, what's your favorite thing in Farmington? Or um, what if you're taking an exercise class outside of fitness, why or where is it? Or just start to get some questions, right? But it was amazing for other members to start to hear from each other. My favorite lesson story of this was um, food and beverage. I asked the group, okay, who has the best hamburger in town? First person, oh, well, five guys. The next person, oh my God, that's awful. It's this company, it's this one. And all of a sudden the members start looking at me as a manager saying, how do you do your job? You know, And you start to see everybody has diverse opinions, but you start to hear things. And the last thing I want to say about listening sessions you start to gain ambassadors, right? You start to get people to come in and they start to listen and they start to understand the why behind things or they start to feel that you've made things change. And I would make a thing, look, just because you tell something in a session does not mean it's going to happen right away. But if there's things that we can fix, we will. I can't tell you and nobody had the idea of the, the angst disposable razors were causing at our club. I heard this come up in multiple sessions. So I went to my fitness director and I said, okay, Robin, Tell me about the razors. She got a big smile. She goes, we get them for five cents a piece from blah, 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 blah. I'm like, everybody hates the razors. And she's like, are you kidding me? I never heard that, right? 
what else aren't you knowing or people aren't bringing to you? So find ways to connect and get these listening sessions with your members. A lot of clubs, especially in this group, you have a lot of traditions. You have a lot of history at your club. My building goes back to 1700s. Thomas Jefferson touched everything, right? Your clubs are no different. But you have to have a respect for tradition, but you can't be bound by it. This stops so many people on a regular basis. They just say, well, this is the way we've always done it. COVID has given us a gift as well. It's giving us a chance to redefine who we are, but you, you can have a respect for your tradition and you can have acknowledgement of it, but don't be so bound to it that you can't change and you're afraid to make a change. The small changes start to build up the big ones. Another funny thing, uh, when you start talking about traditions, my wife says camping's a tradition in my family. It was a tradition in everyone's family. Then we invented the house, right? Start thinking about your club. Start looking at what are you doing and asking the question why. This one always gets me. We were going, I just started working here at the club. We were talking about a capital campaign and we were getting stuck on the, the, the feeling and the traditions. And this was in a newspaper. And this is when the college students usually laugh at me too when I say I look at newspaper. But this was in a newspaper, right? Inspired by 990 years of history, but we're not bound by it. Here's Johnny Walker, right? Here's, a, here's an iconic brand that's trying to struggle with the same thing we are as clubs at this, you know? You know, they're telling people, hey, we have all this history, but we're not bound by it. But really think about it. They have a certain recipe. They have a certain look of their bottle. There's not much they can change, but here they are trying to tell the world, hey, we're still here, but we're gonna be a little different potentially too. You should be doing this. I got this, I sent it to my president, and I said, if, if Johnny Walker can do it, our club can do this. He said to me, oh, I thought you were suggesting we were gonna have Johnny Walker Blue at the next board meeting, right? So what you can start doing is you gotta start putting your guidance and your operations into some kind of plan, right? So we came up with the three R's, right? Everything we did went to retention, relevance, and recruitment. Every major decision at the club was based on these three items. You know, how's it gonna help with retention of our members? Is it relevant to our members? And is this gonna help us recruit new members? This amazing little three words became part of such major decisions at our club. I've been sitting in board meetings where we've had some very contentious things and decisions to make. And when we get stuck, it comes down to, okay, well, where does this apply to the three R's? If it doesn't apply to certain parts of it or all of them, then our decision is made for us. As a manager and operator, we've taken this down even to our staffing levels when we do our performance reviews. You know, when we start talking to our staff, it's no longer, did you do a good job? It's more, what did you do to help with the retention and the relevance and the recruitment of members? And you start looking at all these components, you know, what are your three R's? What are your three W's? Whatever it is for your club, is everybody saying this? Every committee member, we all know, every communication we put out for capital votes, every communication we put out for annual reports, you're gonna find in our reports, we're talking about the three R's and the three R's are mentioned at one point. So innovation, so where does innovation start, right? Innovation is a bunch of ideas. Innovation doesn't have to come from one person. So one of the things you can easily do, doesn't take a lot of time as well. We had a board retreat and at the board retreat, I led a session on innovation with our board members and I said, okay, I broke them up into, I think it was groups of five. I said, okay, you all have 15 minutes to come up with what does the club look like in the future? If money, time, nothing mattered, what does Farmington look like when it turns 100 because we have a centennial coming up? What does it look like? What does it look like in the future? Not, there's no wrong answer. And I gave them 15 minutes. Board members came up with everything from helipads to you name it, things were in there, right? But in a 15 minute period, I had over 300 different ideas of what the members thought the club should be doing in the future. Some of them were crazy, like pet salons and things like that. Well, crazy for our perspective, it could be great for you. But what, you know, there's 300 ideas in 15 minutes right there. So then I said, you know what? I took this to my leadership team. And I said to them, I broke them up into groups. I said, same thing. In 15 minutes, I had another three or 400 ideas of things we can look at or things we can do at the club. I then cross-referenced it. I want to say the number came up to like 82% of the ideas were in both groups. Well, right there, that starts to give you an idea of where you need to go. And again, 
creativity needs to flow. The funny things will come out of this, but it's amazing what you start to see and say, well, you know what? We could offer a coffee cart on Saturdays in this area. That's actually a pretty good idea. So how are you getting your innovation? It can't be from the board. It can't be just from the membership. I mean, the, the general manager, right? How are you creating and capturing these ideas? But really, you also start looking at, and I'm sorry, I'm jumping around to some things because, again, this is a condensed um, presentation here for you. But, you know, what? how much do you as leaders of your club know the fun facts of your club, right? I was given a presentation to a local community um, organization, and my president was there with me. And I started giving the slide you see on on this on this screen here right now was one of the facts that I put up there because I was letting them know who Farmington is. Right at that particular time, we had 35,000 rounds, 32,000 pool visits, 100 acres of grass. You see them on there. Um, the one I always love to point out is the um, 20 pounds of vanilla extract. I don't know about any of you. But I've moved five times and I still have the same little two ounce bottle of vanilla extract that I carry with me. We went through 20 pounds of that that particular year at the club. After the meeting, the president came up and said, I had no idea that our club does all this. Here's a board member. Here's a leader, right? So at the board meeting, he goes, I want you to give these fun facts. So we did the fun facts. This has now become a tradition in our annual report. We have a big thing here. $5 burger nights on Mondays. I know some of your clubs might hate us for it because so many of your members are our members and everybody wants to do $5 burger night, right? But we put out a stat last year that we sold, I can't remember, it was like 20,000 burgers on burger night last year, right? These are amazing things that what it does is you're bragging a little bit, but it's also starting to educate your members and your staff. You're more than just the food and beverage. You're more than just the golf. Look at all these things that it takes to create this love and this experience. And that's what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to engage the membership. You're trying to engage the staff into seeing who you are as a club. So what are your fun facts? What items can you share? And I promise you people are going to get them wrong. I walked around the club after we started doing this, and people would start saying, did you know we had 7 million pounds of grass seed last year? I mean, the number might be wrong, but it's amazing how many people start to talk about you as more than just an institution more of an entity, if that makes sense. So what are your fun facts? Share them. So we start looking into membership and marketing, right? Um, this was, again, a component for, for the marketing association, but this all ties to us, right? So when we start looking at our club, and some of you are very fortunate to have long wait lists, some of you are looking to have wait lists, but this isn't just about getting someone through the door, right? This is talking about who you are as a core. And when you start looking at your membership, we are all selling lifestyle. If you just talk about, well, membership gets you this or membership gets you that, you want to start selling lifestyle. You want to start showing people when they do come to your club what it's like to be part of your brand, what it's like to be part of your culture. And don't lose sight of those membership people that are on this phone. You're joining a club and not a category. So many clubs I see do this when they're giving their membership tours. They start talking about the category of membership you're in, and this is what you get for this. You're joining the club, and your club, and based on what you're doing, you get this in your section, but don't lose sight of you're joining a club. Some clubs are looking to find other ways to engage the community and look at things. What are your affinity groups? And by affinity groups, I'm sorry, by affinity groups, what are the groups in your club that you can start engaging that also starts engaging people for your community, right? So you have real estate people, part of your group. You have um, dentists. You have all these things. You know, we're fortunate to have the University of Virginia right down the road, right? So there's different things that we can do to engage different groups within our club to start taking more pride in what's the one connection, Farmington, right? So we had a thing with dentists not too long ago where a member, we cut him a deal, and we had him come in with some of his friends in town. We're all dentists. They had a great little cookout, a great little golf day. He was hosting them and sponsoring them. It's amazing how many members' applications we received from dentists at that time after the event. They just didn't know who to ask. They just never been experienced or invited to the club, right? So who are those affinity groups that you can connect to within your club and your community? New member outreach. When you start looking at this, right, so most of our clubs are invitation only. So 
a lot of people hate doing the ask. A lot of members start hate doing the ask. You can see the slides from 2015, but that particular year, we had a lot of fun and exciting things going on. So we created this two-pager front back that we gave to all of our members in, in leadership committees saying, hey, if you have anybody you're interested in joining the club, here's this document, just send it on to them and then we'll help you from there. But also it's a marketing piece, right? We're not allowed to market, but you can start showing all the fun things you're doing at your club or all the things you did that particular year, which gives your membership pride, but it also kind of helps you on uh, going on what's there. You have so many people in leadership. We have over 100 people in our governance model. When you look at all of our committees, why are we not trying to engage them to help us with our ultimate goal? This is one I could kick myself for. So I'm working at Cherokee Town and Country Club. I'm working at Atlanta Athletic Club, and I had never seen this till I came here. My marketing manager, I'm sorry, membership manager came to me and said, hey, we have the member guests for tennis next weekend for golf. Um, can we send a note? Because, I mean, how many member guests? It's Uncle John brings Uncle Billy every year, right? It's the same guest every year. The true purpose of a member guest in the beginning of Clubdom was to introduce people to the club and hopefully you get membership, right? But so many people bring the same guest every year because they're going to win it this year, they're going to win it next year. So we got permission and we talked to each of the participants and said, look, we've put this little flyer together. Here's a little information or follow up to the member guest. Um, send it on if, you, if you're okay with that to your guest and we'll see. It's amazing how many people said to us, I've been waiting for someone to invite me or John tell me about it or I'm interested. We have a large non-resident membership. It was amazing how many people we started getting from the member guests and the tennis member guests. Nobody ever follows up from the member guests. You throw this great party and then you just sit back and wait. What are you doing to engage it? So once you get the members in the club, we found they come in, they're forgotten about, they don't know how to sign up for the holidays. They don't know how to do certain things, right? So we came up with this, I think it's a nine-month program, where they get an email every month from the membership department, and it just talks about what's coming up, right? So right before the pool opens, they get an email saying, hey, the pool's about to open. Here's some stuff you need to know. Here's the rules about the pool. Hey, the holidays are coming up. This is how you normally sign up for stuff, right? So many people come into your club. You get their check. They move on. Then they kind of get lost, and sometimes you lose them in the fray. This gives you at least a nine-month connection with these new members, and it gives them that opportunity to say, hey, look, I'm really enjoying the club, or hey, I've been here a couple months. I have some questions about this, right? This can be set up on an automatic thing that doesn't have to take a lot. It's a lot of effort to set it up, but then once you start going, it's are you staying connected to your new members? Again, membership marketing, right? Everybody loves babies. Everybody loves showing off their new babies. I stole this from the country club up in um, Ohio, Pepperdike. Um, that's what we do in the club business. We steal everybody else's ideas, call them our own, laugh to the bank, as Greg Patterson always says. But in doing this, you know, we have a children's place. We're a family-oriented club, right? So we always have trouble with members telling us the age of their kids, updating their pictures, at least letting us know they had babies, right? So we created this bib program where if you, once you have your baby, you bring your your child to the children's place, it gives the children's place a chance to see the children, meet the children, get them into our system. They get this bib, and now when they're showing this baby off to their friends, their relatives, their neighbors, now people are seeing Farmington's logo. They're seeing you and who you are. This doesn't cost you much. Members love to see their babies in the newsletter, right? So we put this in every month, and really this starts to kind of send your message. If you're not a family-oriented club, I don't advise you doing this. If you're a family-oriented club, what ways are you engaging the family? Guest trial membership. I get this question a lot. Certain clubs do these guest trials or summer memberships and things like that. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer for this, but I can tell you most clubs do this wrong. They do a three-month guest trial membership during the peak season, right? So there's no reason. If you think of a car salesman, hey, why don't you take that car home Think about it and then bring it back, right? The idea is you're going to drive around, show it to your friends. There's no way you're going to say no and get rid of it, right? So when I got to Farmington at one point, we had these trial memberships that would start um, usually about April or May, and they would end in July. Well, by the end of July, summer's almost over. Camp's coming in. School's going back. Uh, let me think about it, right? So we switched our dates. We now went from April 1st to 3rd, June 30th. 
And our whole thing was, by the way, the initiation is going up on June 1st. So if you join now at this rate, you get the rate. We know you're going to join. Or if you wait till June 30th, the rate's going up. You can still join. Once they're at the pool, once our kids are part of swim team, once it's the height of summer, they're not going to just stop coming to the club at that point, right? Our closing rate went to about an 85% on this. We're not you're no longer doing a trial membership or a guest membership, but there's a lot of clubs that do this. Are you really doing it at the right time? Or are you just giving them a great high season opportunity? You know that I don't. The one thing you've got to engage is your entire staff. You know, it's not just the membership director. It's not just the general manager. It's not just the membership chairman who's on the board's job, right? You need to engage everybody in the process of sales. When I say sales, that's taboo for some clubs, but really you're trying to get people in there, right? When our golf pro's on the, on the range and he sees the same guest two or three times, he's coming up to our membership director saying, hey, so-and-so showed this person a couple times. We might want to find a way to reach out to them. Tennis does the same thing, right? We have overnight accommodations. If we see the same people coming and going on a regular basis as guests, we find ways to start the conversation with the sponsoring member of, hey, you know, why don't we talk to, can we give a chance to maybe invite so-and-so to be a member, right? So it's everybody's job. If your club's waiting just for the membership director or you're waiting for your reputation to bring people through the door, if COVID hasn't shown us something, life changes quickly, right? Communication. Communication is key in everything we do. This is one of my favorite sayings. The president of High Point University said this at one of our conferences not too long ago, and this has stuck with me forever. People are not afraid of change. They're actually like change. They're just afraid of what they lose in that change. This hit me like a ton of bricks. We are going through a capital project plan. We are trying to get things motivated, and we are hitting some resistance from members, and it hit me. We were so busy talking about all the new great things we were losing sight of, well, I like the club the way it is. I don't want it to change. So we had to change all of our communications and started to make sure that even though we're changing, we're still the same. Going back to tradition bound, going back to all the things we just talked about. People like change. They're always afraid what they're going to lose. Think about that in your daily life. Think about that in your club. This phrase alone, I think, will change a lot of things for you. Instagram. This was always taboo. This is becoming more and more mainstream fact of life, this is where people are going. Our club has our, our Instagram feed. Our chefs have their own. You'll see we do our B program, our chef showing training. It's amazing what this can do for you. I'm talking to the leaders, uh, the managers on the phone right now or the presentation. You know, We started showing our chefs training in the background. We started showing all these different things we're doing. It's amazing how the professionalism image of your club is raised amongst your membership when they start to see, wow, they're actually doing these things, or wow, they're on, on my phone, so they must be important, right? Cakes, we started showing our cakes. We had members coming in, bringing us cakes from things they found online or other magazines, saying, well, can you do this for us? We started showing what we can do with our pastry team. It's amazing how many much of our cakes have now business has gone through the roof. Even during COVID, we're selling a ton of cakes because members are seeing these fun cakes on our Instagram. They're coming in saying, I want just this. Side note, we just had a, a member come in the other day, said, please don't post this cake on Instagram. I know you love it, but I wasn't able to invite all my child's friends, and I don't want them to know that we had a party, so please don't put them. So uh, we're now in the business of hiding cakes. But you've got to get involved in social media. You've got to get involved in YouTube. I encourage you to look at our website to see what we're doing. It's fun things. You'll see my golf pro doing some fun things. We have the tale of Mr. Etiquette and Dr. Root on the golf course, right? It's finding ways to not only promote who we are, but what we're doing at the club. Members, videos, this is the way to go. If you're not doing this, you're going to be left behind. Special projects. A lot of your clubs are, are great golf clubs. A lot of your clubs are focused on these great renovations. Are you telling your story? Are you showing it? During our construction update, we started putting out a weekly update. We had it with this blue logo with the blueprint look. Members knew when this was coming out. This was there. We had a golf course renovation with Corin Crenshaw, and we took members on tours. We took pictures of that. What this also started doing, it gave me a history. Every week now, I knew what was going on, but it also helped the membership get engaged. A lot of our members were sharing this with other people, and then other people were getting engaged. It's amazing. You've got to tell your story. You've got to find a way to communicate and not just let things happen. Don't be afraid to tell the staff. Too often or not, 
we lose sight of this. We talk to the boards, we talk to committees, we focus on all the membership communication, but we're not telling the staff, right? We're not telling the locker room, we're not telling the wait staff. Who's getting the first question? The wait staff. Don't forget to include your communications with your staff. You gotta get involved with your community, okay? It's okay to brag a little bit. I said this, I gave a presentation to our local community. I was showing them we're the 15th largest employer, we do this much in payroll, um, our annual benefits are this, but also we're special in tourism. You wanna start showing people you're more than just a club. You're a part of this community. We're a big part of this community. Most people only know you have a rotary at your club or you have a wedding at your club or you have a golf tournament at your club or that's where the rich people eat. eat. But what do they know about your club? What do they know you're doing for your community? If we weren't here, and I said this in a meeting, if I wasn't here, who would be taking care of these benefits and payroll for this community? Showing your membership in your leadership orientations or your board orientation, showing them everything you're doing is a big part of your community. Club events. I'm sorry, I know I'm going through these really fast. So real quick here, you can create events out of anything, right? I had a member make fun of me because I sent him a note about something we did. And he says, so when are you gonna celebrate your new pool furniture? And I laughed and said, that's a great idea, right? We do so many capital projects around our clubs and a lot of stuff goes unnoticed. Why aren't we celebrating this? This particular thing was we had to put this very expensive historic railing or, or widow's walk railing up on our club, right? I had to figure out how to get a crane in. We had to figure out how to close the front circle to get that up there. It was gonna be a big hassle for everybody. So we decided, you know what, let's have it a party. Let's call it, we're putting the crown back on, right? And we had a party. We had a bunch of members show up. The crane was there. I was only praying that the thing didn't break. Um, and then we did a last minute impromptu raffle, okay? Whoever's here, we pulled four names and you got to go up and do a champagne toast overlooking the um, Blue Ridge Mountains there at sunset. Members engaged. They talked about what we were doing. How do you celebrate what you're doing? Spontaneous events, right? We had a bunch of beer left over from member guests. UVA was happened to be in the World Series at that particular time. Um, we called in a favor with an out, our vendor who gave us this outdoor screen. My HR, I'm mean, sorry, my finance CFO was trying to get rid of this beer inventory. Said, well, why don't we do this? So we had bring a blanket, come watch UVA play because they were playing <clears throat> out of state at that point. You can see this first night, we probably had 50, 60 people show up. The next night we had 70. We gave away $2, we gave away free popcorn, sold a bunch of $2.50 beer, right? But we created a community. We got everybody at our club to get together. What else can you do? Who are your local celebrities, right? Who are the people in your community that are important to you or your club? We happen to have UVA. I keep using that a lot as an example. But we reached out to the band because my golf pro was giving a lesson to the head band person and they were trying to figure out band camp was ending and they wanted to do something special he said to me what if we got the uva marching band to come play for our members i said what's it going to cost he said the only thing you have to do is feed them if you ever fed 350 starving kids from band camp you go through a lot of groceries but Man, we started creating this annual event where their last practice, but not only are we giving our membership something, we're now introducing 350 students to our club. They're talking about it with their parents. We're giving them a great meal. And who else has a Division I marching band at their club, right? You may not have UVA, but what else do you have in your town that you can connect your town with your club? Events at your club. Member organized. Don't have to take a lot of work. I have a bunch of Spanish-speaking members who enjoy doing that. They wanted to get together, ask what they can do. So we put this little ad together. I let them meet in the grill. The only thing I have to do is put the ad out and we give them some, some hors d'oeuvres. They meet, they talk, they talk Spanish. And um, now I've created another instant group in the club. They're leading it. We just got to find a space for it. But it, man, it makes it look like what is the community of your club doing? Polar bear plunge. Every year we do this, January 1st, they all jump in the pool, very cold. We used to have a list of names. Um, God forbid you if you miss up somebody's name in the newsletter. We started saying, well, why don't we give out T-shirts? Cost you a little bit of money. But man, that kid who jumped into the pool on January 1st, when they go back to their school, what's the T-shirt they're going to wear to school? The T-shirt their friends are going to see. Man, Farmington did this. Farmington did that. Now you have these boards around the pool, around the snack bar. They look for their name every year. We talk about the temperature. And we give away a free T-shirt. The men, the, the experience. I mentioned we were doing our golf course. We had to drain this pond, right? A lot of 
stress over draining the pond and what we're going to do with the fish. So we created an event, Save the Fish event, right? We created this event. My golf superintendent did it. We had big fish, little fish. We brought our food truck down here. We had this fishing event. Members got to engage. We were saving the fish. They pulled out 85 fish that day. The next day, my superintendent had to go in and pull out another 300. But in the members' eyes, they saved the fish, right? The only problem this created is everybody loved fishing on property. They now want us to do it more. But it also gave us a reason to explain why we have to drain this pond, why we had to get rid of that ugly wall that you're seeing there, and all the things we're going to be doing to make this better. It engages the membership into your process. So we talk about innovation. Sorry, my slide is fucked here. Uh, one second here. There we go. Oh boy. There we go. Okay, we're good now. Hopefully you see it. Okay, there we go. So innovation, food and beverage. So what does your club do special? You may not have a food truck, but you know, we created our own beer, the only beer you can get here. We everybody loves our cookies, so we're selling our own cookie dough now, you know. So what are the things that your members love about your club that engages them? So when they start taking the cookies and cooking them at home, they can talk to their friends, oh, these are from my club, right? These, this is my beer you can only get here. There's a lot of clubs starting to do this. We started doing this back in 2014, 15, and hopefully we're leading the way in, in the, a lot of this process. But what are the things that your club is special? What makes you special and unique and different? Members from a distance. I mentioned we have a lot of non-resident members who like to connect to the club. The Blue Ridge Room is our view. You've got the mountains. So we put up a webcam on our roof, and that's on our main website. So during out the, throughout the year, whether it be fall season, winter, members can go on and see what's going on at the club. How are you connected, right? You may not have the Blue Ridge Mountains, but what do you have that can connect your membership to your club, and what way can you highlight that with them? Another thing here, we had to work on that roof, as I told you, I had a lot of slate, original slate. Um, it could have just gone into a dump. So what we ended up doing is taking the slate off the roof, putting our logo on it, making it special gifts, having money go to our foundation to help other parts of the building repair. It really started showing, um, you know, Thomas Jefferson put that slate onto the roof. You can have it for $65, but man, what a nice little takeaway and talking piece for your membership. Do you have other things that are special to your club that your membership would like to hold on to. This particular thing, trees. Trees become a big issue, right? Do you have trees on your golf course, memorial trees? Eventually you gotta move a tree, a tree dies. It creates this whole thing, right? So we got out of the tree business. And our thing is the Adirondack chairs that overlook the mountains. So it costs us probably three or $4,000 a year to replace Adirondacks every year. So we made this our memorial program, right? You see that little plaque on the, on the Adirondack chair? The members now buy us the chairs every year. They get to put this little tag on there. When that chair is, gets to a point you can't use it anymore, we have a board we're gonna put those brass plaques on. And people love to go sit out in their friend's chair and do these things, right? What is that special thing at your club that you have that you can engage your membership to help you with as well? I apologize, we have definitely a little lag delay here. Um, facilities. All right. I apologize, but we are. And Joe, it's Kevin. I can see the facilities slides. Okay. Okay. So it's just lagging on my part. Okay. So you see this. All the thing I want to talk about these things, and I go more in depth in my normal presentation. And a lot of this has rung true with COVID as well. Um, Outdoor facilities, especially now, this is what members are looking for. They're looking for social gathering places. Where can they go? Golf facilities of the future, right? Not just a boring driving range. They're looking for practice. They're looking for experience. On the right is an indoor teaching facility. A lot more places are doing this year round with TrackMan and technology is making this amazing. Uh, but year round facilities for golf, short practice areas are key. If you don't have a lot of great practice areas, you got to find ways to do that. That's the time. People want that golf club in their hand. If you have other areas, and this is just an example of fitness, you know, we did a spin class outside. Um, what enhancements can you make with your children's place? 
technology, right? My zone, this isn't an ad for them, but what ways can you integrate technology into fitness? People are looking for fitness. They're looking for swimming facilities. If you're a club that can't have swimming, that's fine. But there are also, what ways can you be more than just golf? Family-oriented activities is where people are. But the height of all that is wellness. And changes don't have to be expensive, right? On the left, if you see the before, my left, um, you see the before, right? We had a spin room and somebody went out, went to Michael's, they bought some beautiful letters, they put right on the wall and that was very inspirational, right? That room was very tired, boring, and what energy is that, right? We got this mural of the Blue Ridge Mountains, we put a new floor in there, we changed the whole look of that room, that room is sold out every day now with fitness, right? That cost cost a couple thousand dollars, but man, the buzz that created for our club and what it did for your area. So changes don't have to be expensive, when you're looking through your facilities. So my last section here when I get into, so COVID, what's the way forward and where are we going? I'm not gonna have a lot of pretty pictures. I'm not gonna have a lot of, ton of ideas for you, but as the leadership of your club, as the people at this conference, you know, what are you talking about with your leadership team? What are you talking about with your management, right? So what about the rest of the year? right? Everybody's different. Everybody has uh, different government regulations right now. You know, with the saying Mike Tyson always says, everybody's got a plan to get punched in the face. Well, there's been a lot of punches for all of us right now. So the rest of the year, what I'm seeing out there, what we're doing at our club is we're reinventing ourselves when it comes to like holiday events, right? We can't have the 600 person, 700 person Thanksgiving, Christmas Eve dinners, all that kind of stuff, buffets. So we're enhancing our to-go program. But we're also doing more than that, right? We're looking at um, the gingerbread decorating is always a big one for our families. We'll do free 400 people for gingerbread decorating, right? We're putting kits together and our chef filming a video with our pastry chef on tips and tricks on how to do this. Members can buy the kit from us. They're going to take it home. Then we're going to have them send us a picture and then we're going to have a competition, right? You can't just get into this holding pattern and not do anything. So what are you doing about the rest of the year? And if some of your clubs are seasonal clubs, that gives you the opportunity to just go about business the normal way. However, I'm guessing most seasonal clubs, members are in those areas. They're not going to Florida. They're not going anywhere else. They're around a lot longer now. They're expecting more from your club. So what ways can you start looking for these things to look at the rest of the year? Safety, cleanliness, all these things are there. If you have a lot of ho hospitality or um, holiday events, how are you reorganizing that? Don't just say, well, we can't do it this year. Somebody else is going to find a way to connect your members. And if your members can brag on your club to their friends who are just sitting at home doing nothing, saying, well, my club's doing this, or my club's doing an online wine testing, or whatever it may be. Again, this goes back to, you know, but this could all change tomorrow, and who knows, right? So what is your strategy as the leaderships of your club, right? Are you in this holding pattern or are you action-based? And this is what's driving me insane if you go anywhere. There is no service anywhere right now. It's amazing when you go places, if you had to take your dog or cat to the vet, you got to wait outside, you got to put something in a bucket, then they'll come get your animal. But it's this very sterile blah. And if you have to do something, people are acting in service right now. As if well, you're lucky we're even doing this for you. You're lucky I even answered the phone for you, right? So when they're at your club and they're getting this service, this focus, this attitude, I can't tell you how many one of our members cannot get over everything we've done. They know we have challenges. They know we've been challenged and we're not quite doing things the way we'd like to do it. But they keep saying to me, Joe, I cannot believe the attitude of your staff. Everybody here is so nice. Everybody here is so friendly. This is who we always been. It's just standing out more because anywhere else you go right now, most places are using COVID as an excuse not to do things, right? And if you're one of those clubs, shame on you. If you're one of those clubs who's just saying, well, I, I, we just need to just wait to see what happens, you're losing out on such a huge opportunity here. Are you action-based? Are your team action-based? How are you reconnecting with your members? How are you redefining yourselves? Excuses will always be there for you, opportunity won't. COVID is challenging, it's stressful, and I'm not going to lie to you and say that it, it's not causing a lot of challenges for a lot of people, especially people in your market. But if you're looking at this from a club, connecting with your membership, 
finding ways to be there for your members. And a lot of you have done this. So I know I'm preaching to the crowd of the choir. If you find your team is making excuses, then find new teammates, right? There's so much opportunity here that we should be taking advantage of. And your clubs are seen as a safe haven. And your brand is on display, right? Nobody would love more than to get a picture of a club doing something wrong. I worry about that every day with everything we do. It gives me a chance to constantly remind our teams what our standards are, but also puts our brand on display. Members are bragging. I don't know about your clubs, but we've given more, we call it tire kicking, more calls, more potential members in the last three, four months than we've seen ever in one year. We're talking over hundreds because members are talking about, well, my club's doing this. I trust what my club's doing. My club standards are this. This is what I've, I've been doing to go every night for my club, or I'm still playing golf. I'm still doing fitness. And there's so many of these other businesses that have just shut their doors. People are starting to say, well, that's where to go. I have so many members saying to me, my wife will not go anywhere but the club. Your club is a safe haven. It will continue. I think clubs have a huge opportunity here, but if you're just sitting back and waiting for things to happen, you're missing this chance to really display who you are. And this gives you that chance to hit change. All of you who are stuck on traditions and afraid to make changes, this gives you a chance to change, right? I've taught more members during this process of why we don't make money. And yes, you still had to pay your dues, but we're still losing money. They just could not understand why we weren't just getting all this free money and why we needed more money, right? This gave me and the president a chance to really educate the business model of clubs. This also gave us a chance to make changes, right? Why are we always doing this? Why have we always offered? You know, our golf team's loving it, right? We normally, if you would look at our calendar events, we had we had an event for everybody, right? That was all that was doing was clogging up the golf course, stopping people from doing certain things. We went through, we got rid of all those special events. We changed up how we're doing certain things. And events, I said, Rob, what do you want to get rid of? Well, I would really hate, hate this event. Let's not do it this year. We have a reason not to. And now we can educate why this is so much better. So use this opportunity to implement your change, but also educate your membership on why you're special, what you're doing, and really who you are as a club. Focusing for those on you looking at your own areas. Are you the employer of choice? So many restaurants have closed their doors. So many service businesses are still. Disney just laid off or shut the door on 28,000 employees, right? Clubs are still strong. There's so many great stories of clubs where members paid money to keep their staff employed. Are you telling your story so you can start really taking advantage of the workforce that's out there? Are you that employer choice? Are your members and your staff proud of how you're reacting to this? And another last question I always give is what about the budgets? What are you doing about the budget? Our budget's blown out of the water. Or some of you, if you have the right fiscal year, your budgets look amazing, right? For the most part, I'm seeing all over the mark. But what I can tell you, what we did as a club and what a lot of clubs are doing, we have basically three budgets, a red, yellow, green, very creative, right? Red is the world comes to a shutdown. Yellow is kind of where we are now with restrictions. Green is we're back to normal. And we kind of looked at all three budgets and we're looking at a range, right? We're going to present to our finance committee and board, okay, here's best case scenario or here's what we think we're going to land, right? Here's what we think the dues need to be, but we're not going to cover you know, the church for Easter Sunday, right? We're not going to cover this far extreme, and we're not going to cover this one, but this is where I think we're going to be in the middle. But with these three budgets throughout the year, I at least have something I can work on month by month and kind of redo our forecasting, and my CFO helps me with a lot of this. But, you know, the budgets, I don't have the right answer for you. Everybody, some people are just throwing in big dues increases, which I'm not quite sure might be the right answer for some of you, but that might be a necessity. But budget is a guideline, right? Budget is there to figure out where you could go. Are you having these honest conversations about, well, if things get better, great. If things don't get better, or what do you think about this? Um, this three budget approach, it seems like a lot, but it really isn't. You do the green one, which is full bore, and then you just kind of dial back from there. But now my CFO and I can look at worst case, best case scenarios, and we can guide the finance committee and board on where we think we need to be. And I think this is the last one, leadership and communication, right? Leadership is on display day in and day out right now, not only for your managers of your club, but for your board members. How are you leading through this pandemic? Where are you looking? If you're in that holding pattern and it's the woe is me, you're stuck. 
if you're positive, and I'm not saying positive where it has to be fake, but hey, this is these are the facts, and here's what we think we can still do, and this is why we're doing what we're doing, and the communication piece, right? Um, I, and especially during COVID, felt like every week I was writing some kind of new update, right? Um, but it was amazing how that communication translated to trust with the membership for the board, for the committee, for me, no matter who wrote it, right? I would send out a great communication, be proud about it, and I'd run into a member like, oh, the president, man, he just sent out one of the best communications. Okay. He'd send something out, man, that GM we have, that, that's communications are just have been spot on, right? It's funny, but people, doesn't matter who's saying it, they just want to hear from you. So if you haven't been communicating and talking and educating and being a leader during this time, trust starts to come in, right? People start to wonder what's going on. What about the finances? Or where are we with the finances? Or why aren't we doing this? The questions start to come, and then the more pressure starts to come. So leadership and communication are key. So my parting thoughts for you, then I'll open up the question. You have to find ways to integrate your club with your members' lives. Right? You can't just sit back like years past, and some of you might be lucky enough to be able to still do this on this call, but you have to find ways to integrate into your members' lives to become part of who they are. COVID has highlighted this more than anything. If you're just sitting back and waiting, life can change very fast, and now you're playing catch up. So integrate your ways with your members' lives. And this is one of my favorite sayings. I've said this. If you find somebody else who said this, they've stole it from me. Just kidding. You're either going to be a hero or a zero. So you might be the best at one of them, right? My first time I brought that food truck on this property, it just came out as an idea. Long story I don't have time to get into but we just took a chance. That thing rolled up onto our property on July 4th. You wanna talk about, I looked at my manager and I said, well, we're gonna be heroes or zeros at the end of this one, but we took a shot, right? So take a chance. Now, your first couple swings of the bat could be small, but once you start building that confidence, you can start taking bigger swings with the membership, with your leadership team and things like that. So with that, I invite you to come see us. If you've never been there, there's some of our view, there's the fall, there's the spring. Please come see us. We have a special place. Uh, we're not doing everything right, or at least trying to do something, and that's all I'm hoping to encourage you. I hope this presentation did was to say there's a lot of opportunity for so many things. Just take a chance. Try new things. You'll never know what engages your membership, more importantly, your community and your staff, and I promise you that will reinvigorate, rejuvenate, and create some innovation within your club. So with that, question. Thanks, right John. On. It's Kevin. Right on time. Well done. And uh, appreciate you spending time with us today. Uh, I know it's a busy schedule for you and for everyone on the call. So uh, we're going to unmute everyone. Please, I encourage you to ask questions of Joe. I think we saved the best for last. It's been a, a busy week of sessions, but a lot of great ideas, hopefully, that you'll be able to take back to your club. So um, please speak up as we unmute you. But Joe, just uh, for me, you know, you touched on this a bit, but what we have here in our area, you know, our ambassador meeting, which are liaisons between the clubs, the common theme that always comes up is that this isn't your your father's club anymore, but your father's still a member. So whether it's wearing right. jeans or playing music out on the golf course, all those types of things, you still want to right accommodate uh, the older folk and and the newer generation. So any insights? Yeah, exactly. yes, as a matter of fact. So, yeah, I, I would say, again, this is going back to it's it's challenging and it's even more challenging now with COVID because there's a lot of people that you're playing golf at your car or rounds or through the room. We're doing almost 50,000 rounds this year. I showed you our normal year is 35,000. That's probably not different than any of yours. So you have beginners. There's a lot of people that have flooded your areas in golf and tennis and all these things. Um, I think you just got to have the mantra, just be respectful, you know, and try to really highlight for people who you are as a culture, what's important, what are the must haves, right? What are the things that we will not stand for? And then the rest of it, you have to use judgment. And I would say the more you encourage that, the more you're going to get people to buy into who you are. I'm not saying it has to be lawlessness and we have some of that as well. And you have to address that. That's the one thing you can't lose sight of. If there is true violations, I mean, really violations, the board, and the leadership have to address it because if he doesn't, then that shows other members what they can do. And then you kind of see what's going on in our country. Right. So I believe 
that you have what is true to you, hold true, you hold people accountable. Everything else, you got to make those judgment calls, and then you got to question yourself. I'm not saying you have to bog down every board meeting or committee meeting with things, but bring things to okay. Like, let's talk about this. How important is this to us? Having music on the golf course is that truly receptive? You know, clubs are still talking about jeans, but not many clubs now, right? Jeans have, you know, the world hasn't gone to hell in the club world because jeans are now allowed on property. It has maybe engaged things differently or made people approach things. But these, we hold on to these traditions and these things, as I said before, we're bound by them. Ask the why question and have an honest conversation with yourselves. Good answer. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, was somebody trying to chime in for a question? Again, please feel free to speak up. Well, I would bring up the the uh, polar bear plunge. That was pretty a pretty cool thing. Um, you know, finding these moments, I guess, in club life that you can just kind of come up with a new innovative idea. The pool's been there forever. Probably the polar bear is a new thing. So doing things like that, or or maybe even finding somebody um, to be a proponent of this, um, kind of your right hand man who kind of helps push whether it's the the fishing in the pond or or the polar bear plunge you know finding that member who can kind of uh help drive the uh the message to the rest of the membership absolutely and i, I cut that from my presentation but that's one of the things i talk about is is your your advocacy groups right who who on your team who in your club can help you drive these because it can't be just one person it can't be just this entity the board right you need to start driving these things through your membership and finding out who those leaders are and bring them into the fold saying, hey, we really think we would like to do this, but I need your help kind of promoting this. It's amazing when you start inviting people to be part of it and they believe in it, you can just sit back and let things run. You know, I'd rather be pulling back on the reins than pushing the horse, right? Yeah, and we had, uh, you know, Tom Wallace and Kurt Keebler on earlier talking about staffing. I know you guys have done a, a great job over the last couple of years on staffing, um, internship programs. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, Disney laying off 20 something thousand employees. Um, a second, uh, if you would, just on, you know, how, how you've embraced the staffing issue over the last year and maybe even just given the COVID. So staffing is always hard. You know, we were in, I, I think your market's probably similar. Um, prior to COVID, we had less than 2% unemployment rate. And anybody in this area wanted to work for the university, right? So finding, and we only have 150,000 people in this area. And Charlottesville has, at that time, 450 restaurants. Per capita, we were the second or third in the country per capita of restaurants, right? So that's my competition. For You put one cook, one server, you start doing the math on who goes to university, who's working for the university, who's working for government, our population was small. So we had to really start getting out and promoting who we were, what benefits. You know, we offered English as a second language for free. Um, we started doing different things within the community to let them experience who we were as Farmington, whether it be our chef, whether it be our, you know, we're part of the first tea, we're inviting that, that group to come in here, we're hosting the first tea tournament. How do you start inviting people who may be afraid to come over? We, our club, you have to go over railroad tracks, so we're at rest of, just over the tracks. Getting them to come over, come through those gates, and seeing who you are and maybe aspiring to work there, maybe aspiring to be there. So you've got to get out and have ambassadors in your community pushing people your way. I would say, and the board probably got sick of this for a while, but every meeting I would have, they'd say, give us a staffing update. I was like, if you see anybody out in any restaurant you love or anybody in any wherever, grocery store, send them my way. Let us know about them. And people just started, hey, I had this great person. You might want to give them a call, right? So there's ways, but you you can't wait for HR to do it. You can't wait for an ad in the paper to do it. You've got to engage members and staff in your staffing situation. Yeah, Tom mentioned earlier, if, if you're not growing, they're going. So you want to continue to bring on that that good that good staff. Absolutely. Well, it, it sounds like everyone's being shy. I know you're all out there. So if there's no final questions for Joe. Just want to thank Joe very much for your time over the last couple of weeks, getting things ready and, and spending time with us today. And I want to thank all of you for hanging in there this week. Fortunately, we couldn't see you at Glen Oaks on Tuesday for golf, but 
looking forward to next year, hopefully getting back to Glen Oaks for golf and seeing you all in person. Um, I'm going to try and take Joe up on his offer to come visit Farmington. It looks like a great place. Maybe in the winter, I'll do the polar bear plunge. So uh, everybody, thanks again. Uh, if you have any questions, always reach out to Kira or myself or feel free to reach out to Joe. Uh, certainly a, a great resource. So thanks again for everything this week, for particip participating. And uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks.